烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，烧埃铃铃声。Namaste. So today we're going to talk about how to attain the unbreakable meditation. Anybody who's tried to meditate knows <laughs> you can so easily get distracted、uh, or interrupted, or so many things can go wrong and break your concentration. So we're going to talk about that. But first, if you haven't watched yesterday's video, here's a link. You're going to need that information to understand what we're talking about today. So, if you haven't watched it, go back, do that now, and then watch this video. It'll be far more informative and less confusing. So, yesterday we talked about <laughs> the four vadas.、Huh? Here's the good old chart. One more time. <laughs> Really, you got to learn this chart. You got to understand it because this is the overview of the entire path, from the very beginning of the arousing of God consciousness all the way to the very top of complete identification with Brahman, full self-realization. So, this is why there are often contradictory or different instructions. In different scriptures or different paths, because each one of them is usually only covering a small part of the entire path. The four stages: Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Ajata Vada have very different styles of meditation. In each one of them, different things can go wrong, can and do <laughs> go wrong. So, what does meditation look like? In the Dvaita Vada, well, here's our chart from yesterday. In the Dvaita Vada, one is concerned with external rules and rituals. This is the karma yoga that builds up the beneficial karma, the the bank balance of cause and effect that allows you to attain enlightenment eventually, after going through the other stages. But without a good balance of auspicious karma, you cannot attain the higher stages. And I don't know how many times I've said it, but every day I see people who attempt to go into meditation without a good balance of a pious karma, good karma. You know, people nowadays are atheistic, and they think that these rituals and stuff are just kid stuff, or that they're just arbitrary. Or that they don't do anything, but they do. It's just that the effects are so subtle that when you're in dualistic consciousness, you can't perceive them. And they also take time to manifest because you have to change. <laughs> so a person in Dvaita Vada is concentrating on the rules and regulations, performing rituals in the temple or church or mosque, reciting prayers or mantras, or Studying different kinds of philosophy and so on and so forth. Now, meditation in this stage is focused on the senses, because one has to perform the regulations, the rituals according to all the rules, and recite the mantras and prayers and so on accurately. And you know, there's just so many things to keep in mind. It's very easy to make a mistake. And in fact, there are even prayers for rectifying mistakes <laughs> in the Vedas and other scriptures. So, what does that mean? Because the material world is changing, it's changing all the time. That's what it is.、Huh? It is time and change, cause and effect. So the material world is changing. That means even though we try to adhere to a certain ritual, a certain procedure, a particular mantra, or hold on to a certain thought or model of reality, 
that it keeps getting interrupted. We forget the mantras, or we make a mistake in the procedure, or we get something wrong in the philosophy, <laughs> or the mind is jumping all over the place and we can't concentrate. All because in Dvaita Vada we conceive of the, the world as real and the body as the self. So once you get beyond Dvaita Vada in the stage of Bhakti, now things are better. Let's take a look at Vishishta Dvaita Vada. In Vishishta Dvaita Vada, we have something that we didn't have in Dvaita Vada. We have the Jnana Tattva, the firewall between the observer, the watcher, the experiencer or consciousness and the rest of the world. So this reminds us that, hey, you're not your body. You're not your senses. You're not your mind or your intelligence. You are something beyond all these. So this thought alone shields us from so much of the nonsense, the stuff that goes wrong in Dvaita Vada. <laughs> Because now we're not attached so much to the body, the senses, mind, intelligence, and the material world. Now we know we're something beyond this world. We don't really know what it is yet. Huh? Because in the stage of bhakti, we're concentrating on the heart chakra. We are involved in an emotional, primarily an emotional relationship and a service relationship with God. So even though we don't have maybe a full or a clear conception of God, still we have developed love for God in whatever form or whatever name that we conceive of the Supreme. And because of this, the mind is automatically attracted. Huh? There's nothing more attractive than love. Love is the most beautiful thing, isn't it? So. Because of this spontaneous attraction, now there's no need to depend upon the ever-changing material world or different scripted rituals or complicated mantras or particular philosophy or any of that. That's still there, but it's no longer primary. It's very much secondary. And the idea that I am in a relationship with God is the primary focus. So this kind of meditation is much less fragile. It's still not anti-fragile, but it's much more robust than the meditation in the Dvaita Vada. So now let's take a look at the next stage, Vivarta Vada. In Vivarta Vada, one begins meditation for real. This means that one concentrates the mind, the intelligence, on the idea that I am not different from God. I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. So this idea becomes the central idea and the material world, the objects of the senses, the body, the mind, the intelligence, all fade into the background. Now you might say, well, we're using the intelligence to concentrate on the idea that I am Brahman. Yes, that's true, in the beginning at least, until it becomes a habit. And once it becomes a habit, then wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever the senses are engaged with, whatever the mind is doing, jumping all over the universe <laughs> the way it does, we know I am Brahman. All this other stuff may be going on, but that's not me. That's the difference. We no longer identify with the material world. And in the higher stages of the uh, Vivarta Vada, then our attention turns toward Brahman itself. We become directly aware of Brahman. Now, if you haven't had the experience, well, just wait. <laughs> it's really terrific.
<laughs> when you perceive Brahman directly for the first time, it's a very big deal. Uh, it's like biblical, you know, the angels come down out of the sky blowing trumpets. And th well, not quite, but it feels like that. It feels grand and theatrical and huge. Uh, and this is called first path realization. When we first get a direct perception of the absolute. Up till now, we have been looking at the reflection of the absolute in our mind and intelligence. But at this point, we perceive the absolute directly. The ego automatically drops. And so now there's nothing to really to distract us. Because what? Brahman is everything. Whatever we see, whatever we think, whatever we know, whatever we experience in any way is nothing but Brahman, covered over with the upadis, right? The limiting adjuncts that limit Brahman in various ways to make it look like the body, the mind, other people, trees, houses, the sky, the sun, all this stuff that we perceive in ordinary consciousness is actually nothing but Brahman covered over with Upadis. And the Upadi that we perceive is directly related to our state of consciousness. So if we go back to the original four Vadas chart, Chatur Darshanam chart, we see that in the early stages of meditation, we're working with waking consciousness, Jagrat. And Jagrat means multitude of objects. But then in the higher stages, beginning with Bhakti uh, and then Raja Yoga, we're concentrating on only one thing, Brahman. And in the final stages of meditation, the ego drops completely, just disappears, and there is nothing but Brahman. So this is the stage of Jivan Mukta. And we've had the pleasure to meet a couple of them in our life experiences. <laughs> and so nothing is more wonderful than having a relationship with a Jivan Mukta. And this is what's commonly known as guru, guru and disciple, guru shishya. But even with that relationship, we still personally ourselves have to become realized. And that means doing the work. So wherever you find yourself in the Chatur Darshana, uh, most people are in the Dvaita Vada stage. They still think the body and the world are real. They still think that the mind and intelligence is the self. They still think that consciousness is the ultimate. But no, consciousness is not... <laughs> Brahman is beyond consciousness because it's beyond duality. Consciousness is duality because it has a subject and an object. So as long as you have two, you're still not in full realization of Brahman. But the Jivan Mukta, how did Ramana Maharshi one time express it? He said it's oh, like the ocean comes into the drop. It's very paradoxical. It's not logical. Uh, it's impossible, quote unquote. But it happens. <laughs> and when the ocean comes into the drop, then everything changes. But nothing changes. Oh, it's hard to explain. <laughs> it's a paradox. It has to be a paradox. Because the individual doesn't really exist. So what we call the individual is really just an aggregate, the Buddha taught. An aggregate means a collection of a bunch of different things. The body, the mind, the intelligence, the ego, desires, and so many other things are simply, again, upadis and vasanas. 
Upari means to cover and limit Brahman so that it appears to be individual and small and so on. And Vasana means a tendency of the mind, the uh, momentum of the mind established in past lives. And so these things come up by karma, by destiny, by fate, by providence. And they push us around and they basically cause us to do the things that we do in our lives, which creates more karma and leads to another birth and so on. But this whole thing can be stopped by this one practice of knowing that I am Brahman. I am Brahman. And you still have to work your way up through the levels. That's a given. You still have to go through the four vadas. You can't just jump from the bottom to the top. <laughs> You're just going to fall down again. But if you keep in mind from the beginning, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And first you learn to love Brahman. And then you learn to see Brahman directly. And then in time, you get to realize that you are nothing but Brahman. This is the highest truth. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.